hello and welcome to Russians with Attitude, based in Russia, episode number 2. Today's topic is dedicated to the life and the struggle of Pyotr Vrangel, great and probably one of the most competent white army commanders who recently got popularized in the English-speaking world thanks to Mystery Grove. If you are curious, what qualifications do we even have to tell you about anything regarding history? Well, Kirill is one of the most important historical and political Russian writers of the last decade, and he's also a classically trained internet expert on White Army, Russian Civil War, and more. It won't be exaggeration to say that White Army lore and Civil War in general was popularized in the young adult Russian political sphere thanks to Kirill and a couple other people. When have you found this intense interest in this field and what motivated you to dive this deep? Well, first of all, thank you for such kind words. Um, I guess I won't be falsely humble, and yeah, it's true. I think I kind of revived the interest in uh, Russian Civil War history among the politicized Russian young crowd. Um, yeah, I myself, I got interested in this topic at a very young age, mostly because of my dad. He is um, also um, amateur history enthusiast. Like, he has no formal training in history, but he's been interested all his life and he has an impressive personal library of history books and many of them um, civil war books from the early 90s when this stuff was finally allowed in Russia, you know? Many of these books couldn't be printed in the Soviet Union and in the early 90s you had just this huge wave of civil war literature flooding the country and so yeah, my dad has a rather impressive collection and he gave me these books from a very young age so I remember um, he gave me the memoirs of uh, Anton Vasilievich Turkul, Drazdovce uh, Wagne, one of the also most interesting and charismatic uh, white army leaders at the age of, I think I was 12. So it was uh, right after I read um, Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. So it kind of got mixed in with all this adventure literature that uh, young boys always read. And yeah, so I was familiar with it from a very young age and I studied it on my own. It's a huge interest of mine and uh, yeah, I think that's how I got where I got. <laughs> you got lucky that your dad didn't have an entire library dedicated to Adolf Hitler, like it usually is the case <laughs> <laughs> when boomers are interested in history. Yeah, uh, actually my dad has a friend who is like this, uh, who is like a huge... Um, Hitler you know, fan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he also gave me like Nazi literature when I was 13. So. <laughs> in Germany, uh, right? Uh, no, no, in Moscow. Oh, <laughs> that would be funnier. <laughs> yeah, he was, uh, that guy is uh, actually pretty interesting. He's like uh, incredibly big. He's like, I'm pretty tall and he's like two heads taller than me. And he was one of the OG neo-Nazis in Russia. Like uh, there was in 87, I think, uh, there was some huge street battle between fans of the football club uh, Spartak Moskva and the Moscow neo-Nazis. And uh, actually my dad and this guy participated in this battle, but from opposite sides. Uh, so uh, my dad was a soccer fan in his youth and uh, that other guy was a hardcore neo-Nazi and yeah. So yeah, it's very interesting lore. Uh, and I think it's uh, um, quite interesting actually when boomers get into history like really hard. Uh, it seems to happen really often, but it's, yeah, it's mostly World War II. It reminds me of the time when my grandma said to me on the phone that she has a copy of Mein Kampf in German. <laughs> so <laughs> I was curious. So when I visited her, I asked, uh, show me this copy of yours. And she gets from the shelf a copy of Das Kapital in German. <laughs> and she hasn't uh, looked at it in a while. It, it got gotten mixed up a bit. Basically the same thing. 
All yeah. right. <laughs> so let's start with uh, Black Baron's early life. I think we should uh, look uh, even earlier than that, uh, before he was born, at the family he comes from, the Wrangel. The Wrangel family is a very distinguished um, aristocratic family, originally from Denmark, but they very early um, were split up into different uh, you know, wings of the family. Some were in different lines. Uh, the most famous before the Russians uh, were living in Sweden and were a whole dynasty of uh, Swedish military officers and generals. And then you had the Wrangels in Germany and also in Spain. And uh, they came to Russia in the late 18th century, mostly after the Seven Years' War. So at the Battle of Poltava, during the Great Northern War, when Russia soundly defeated the Swedish army and basically ended the Swedish Empire for good. 22 members of the Wrangel family died on this day and they were all on the Swedish side because the Russian line of the Wrangels uh, joined uh, the Russian service only later. So, but yeah, uh, the family was also very large and very influential and famous in Russia. They gave to Russia a whole bunch of leaders, both in civilian and military life, 18 generals two admirals, uh, one famous explorer, um, there is, you know, maybe the maybe you've heard of it, the Wrangel Island, uh, it's named after this explorer. In the Arctic Ocean. Yes, in the far north, uh, next to Hyperborea, and uh, also one of the leaders uh, who captured the famous Caucasian insurgent Imam Shamil, he was also one of the Wrangel family. So yeah, what I always liked was also um, the motto of the aristocratic Wrangel family. In Latin it is Vrangas non flectis, and translated it means something like you can break me but you cannot bend me, which I think is a very good motto and it very much applies to the life of Piotr Nikolaevich. And so yeah, we should start off with that. Yeah, so Piotr was born in 1878 in a small town, Novo Aleksandrovsk, which is in modern-day Lithuania. He acquired an education as an engineer and volunteered to enroll into the lifeguard horse regiment in uh, 1901. Why did he leave this regiment so early? I think he went to the military out of tradition, out of family tradition and family obligation, because it's a 300-year-old military family and not going to the military is just not an option. So after uh, finishing his engineering degree in St. Petersburg, uh, he joined the Lifeguard Cavalry Regiment and then after um, finishing his military studies at the Nikolaevske Kavalerijske Uchilische, which was the foremost military school for cavalry officers in the Russian Empire, he became an officer of the guard and joined the reserves, after which he left the army to uh, pursue his civilian career. He was, I think he was also very much interested in, uh, I think he was probably autistic, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because he had, uh, um, I don't know, he's like kind of, he's giga chat basically. He's, uh, he was great at everything he ever did. So he was a fantastic engineer. He was very autistically interested in minerals. And uh, during his civilian life, he was working as a surveyor in Irkutsk, working for the local government, well, to find minerals and earth resources. But he also was still active. He had a very active social life. He was a great dancer. Uh, the girls loved him. So because he was also very tall, like he was uh, 6'3 or 6'4, I think or even taller, 6'5", maybe, I, I don't uh, remember So, exactly. he was so autistic that he was uh, great at picking up girls as well. He yes. studied yes, it. Uh, <laughs> he, has, <laughs> he has the look, uh, I gotta say. The determined INTJ stare. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. He's like, uh, yeah, he's like, he had a huge talent for organization. And uh, I have read that he was also like really really good at organizing parties like everyone loved him uh, because his parties were the greatest ever 
So I think these organizational talents, they were great wherever he applied them. In government service, in civilian life, in party life, or in the military. He was just extremely f fucking good at organizing shit. So then, when he was still in the Far East, the Russian-Japanese war started. And of course, as a Vrangel, he had no choice but to join the army. Um, it's, I think it's just genetic at that point. So he joined the army. Had he stayed in St. Petersburg, he probably would have spent the war also in St. Petersburg and wouldn't have seen any action because the lifeguards weren't uh, thrown on the other side of the world in Asia. But uh, having done what he did, he joined a local unit, uh, namely the second regiment of the Transbaikal Cossack host. Um, he became a squadron leader uh, very early on and fighting the Japanese he actually earned his first military decoration, the Order of St. Anne and uh, of St. Stanislav. After the Russian-Japanese war he stayed in the army and he, well, he spent the rest of his life in the army basically. So he had like four years of civilian life which he could enjoy. After being decorated in the Russian-Japanese war, he proceeded uh, to uh, go to military school again and he uh, started in 1914 when World War One started. He became a squadron leader in the again in the lifeguard cavalry regiment, one of the most decorated and most prestigious military units of the Russian army. And he was actually one of the first Russian officers to be awarded the St. Saint, Saint George's Cross, which is one of the highest military decorations uh, the Russian army actually had to offer. It was a pretty famous, um, actually, battle. It was the Battle of Kaufen. Wrangel uh, was leading his cavalry unit into a straight-on attack against uh, German artillery and he had his horse shot down from under him and fell to the ground and then he just picked up another horse and continued the attack and then they actually captured the German artillery they captured the artillery, they destroyed uh, the artillery unit soldiers and they captured like four crates of uh, artillery shells to use in Russian artillery and for this he was awarded the St. George's Cross as you can see, he was a very determined man, and his service, actually it was his service with the, in the Russian-Japanese war, when he served with the Transbaikal Cossack Coast, when he learned to appreciate the cavalry attacks. Um, many people at that point thought that the age of cavalry was over, because you had machine guns, you had heavy artillery, you had trench warfare, everything like that, and most uh, higher-ups in military science thought that the age of massive cavalry raids was over. Wrangel did not belong to this group. He believed in the power of horse uh, riders to disrupt and uh, even destroy enemy formations, which would prove extremely useful, especially in a civil war, when cavalry was one of the main uh, mainstays of the white army tactics. So he was a very talented cavalry officer and in 1915 he became again commander of a Cossack re regiment of the same Cossack host with which he had served 10 years earlier, the Transbaikal Cossack host. Uh, funnily enough, uh, two people who served under him in this unit who would become kind of important later on were the famous fellow Baron uh, Raman von Ungern Sternberg and uh, Ataman Semyonov. Both of those were young cavalrymen serving under Vrankel at that point. Yeah, we probably need to do a separate episode on Steinberg. Yeah, he's a very famous person, but it's mostly like, you know, uh, he's meme famous. People yeah. only know shit about the Buddhism stuff in Mongolia when actually he had a rather interesting military career, which wasn't at all like what many people believe it was. So he continued serving in the Russian army. He was a very talented cavalry officer. He rose to the ranks. Uh, he soon became major general, lieutenant general. And then the revolution happened. Wrangel didn't believe in the revolution. He was a monarchist, which was pretty normal for his social stratum of lifeguard officers, of aristocrats, of uh, military aristocracy. They were all very 
convinced and uh, distinguished uh, in their service to the Tsar, especially for foreigner. It had a very the foreigner aristocrats and Russian service had a very special relationship to the throne uh, because they were tied more by you know traditional feudal understandings of the relation between uh, the governed and the governing. So he stayed in the army nonetheless and continued serving all throughout 1917 uh, when he uh, he was even decorated once more with the uh, St. George's Cross in the summer of 1917. And then he, uh, when the army completely fell apart and he didn't see any future uh, for him in the army of the Russian Republic as it was called, uh, he went just went home with his family to his summer house in Yalta in Crimea. There he was arrested by the communists at the end of 1917, but he managed to get away. After which he went to Kiev. Kiev at that time was uh, in the Ukraine, the Ukrainian state of Hetman Skaropatsky. Skaropatsky was also a general of the Russian Imperial Army and supported by the Germans. He was a leader of the, well, basically the Germans uh, at that point, they were still occupying large parts of Ukraine and they even moved further and uh, occupied almost the whole of Ukraine, the whole uh, west of Ukraine. Skaropatsky was kind of a compromise figure. He was not a communist because the Germans didn't want anything to do with the communists and he wasn't Russian because the Germans were kind of still more or less at war with Russia, as the, everyone understood it. So Skaropatsky was a compromise figure. Um, he he also a has a f really funny surname, which could be translated as soon to fall, Skaropatsky. Yes, basically, yes, that's uh, true, actually. I, I've actually never thought about <laughs> this, but now that you say it, yes, it's very funny. Um, <laughs> so he didn't so last, right? Yes, he didn't last <laughs> very long, uh, <laughs> obviously. Uh, but Skaropatsky, uh, vilified by many Russian patriots for being a Ukrainian separatist, was actually pretty friendly to the Russian cause overall. Because Skaropatsky wasn't a Ukrainian nationalist. The Ukrainian nationalists, uh, they were um, basically the organization of Simon Petlure. They were radical Ukrainian nationalists and uh, Skaropatsky also didn't like them at all. Skaropatsky's position was, in case of a victory over the revolutionaries, was a kind of aristocratic feudal Ukraine with a large degree of autonomy within the Russian Empire. So he didn't really want to split up Russia and Ukraine. He just wanted more power uh, for himself and uh, his social stratum. Mm. So uh, he saved actually many future white officers. He saved many Russian officers uh, from the communists. Many people could uh, find um, themselves a safe place in Kiev uh, at Skaropatsky's court. But Wrangel soon became disappointed with Skaropatsky because Skaropatsky was completely dependent on the force of the German army. And Wrangel understood that as soon as the Germans would withdraw their support, the Skaropatsky's government would immediately fall, which is, of course, exactly what happened. And so Wrangel left Kiev again and went on to join the volunteer army, which was what the White Army was called at that point. And it was uh, the White Army was founded by Generals Karnilov and uh, Alexeyev in the south of Russia, uh, near Rostov and Wrangel joined them and uh, immediately became commander of a cavalry division. Uh, he continued doing what he did best, being a cavalry officer. Um, there were many interesting operations, but we can't really go into them all, but we'll talk about a couple of them. So Wrangel, he didn't really like how cavalry was being used by the White Army or by the Russian Army in general at this point. Uh, he saw the role of cavalry as kind of an iron fist to, to break the lines and not use them for small raids over the whole front. Wrangel thought that the best use of cavalry was concentrating it in a single point to strike through the front and make an, a hole in the enemy lines 
into which then the infantry could pour. So uh, Wrangel's cavalry was very distinguished itself in the battles in Kuban and the Northern Caucasus. And in the beginning of 1919, Wrangel became the commander of the Caucasian Volunteer Army. At that point, he was already in very kind of a bad relationship with the commander-in-chief, General Dinikin. Dinikin was a political liberal, and it was, it's actually nobody really understands how Dinikin even became the commander-in-chief of the White Army. He was a personal friend of General Markov, whom everyone greatly respected and liked. And General Markov died in the early months of the Civil War. And uh, he was kind of, uh, along with General Karnilov, who was also almost worshipped by his soldiers. And Dinikin, kind of because of his personal relationship with them, uh, he kind of rose to the top as a compromise figure because they just didn't know who else to put uh, on top because all the great heroes of the first months of the Civil War Karnilov, Markov, Drazdowski, they had all just died, and Alexeyev, and uh, they had to put someone in charge, so they put Dinikin in charge. Dinikin was, as I said, a political liberal, uh, he was not great at personal diplomacy, and he had, was uh, involved with liberal politics even before the revolution, and he didn't like former Tsarist officials. Of course, as a general, he was in pretty good relationship with his fellow army leadership, but he had a pretty bad relationship with almost all other parts of the Russian imperial government, So, which kind of sucked for the White Army, because Dinikin explicitly forbade them from uh, accepting people who were serving in the Russian intelligence forces, for example, in the Akhane Adilene, which was sort of the secret police of the Russian Empire, and Dinikin explicitly forbade them from serving in the White Army, which of course greatly diminished the intelligence capabilities of the Russian Army, because there just was no military intelligence at that time, uh, like only Cossacks and scout units and no real intelligence and counterintelligence, which is of course extremely important in a civil war, which is a war of political ideologies. And to not have a political police is just willful ignorance at that point. So Dinikin and Wrangel disagreed on many, many, many things, and especially on the so-called Tsaritsyn question. Uh, Tsaritsyn is a city on the Volga, which was became famous when it, were, when, when it was named Stalingrad. So uh, Stalingrad or Tsaritsyn was also a focus in the civil war. There were a lot of bloody battles fought around, fought around it. It uh, changed hands several times. And basically Wrangel didn't want to spend time mm. um, um, Wrangel wanted to attack Tsaritsyn as soon as possible because Wrangel saw the capture of Tsaritsyn as a way to unite the two white armies, uh, to open up the way to the east, to join the forces with Admiral Kolchak, who was the leader of all anti bolshevist forces in Siberia and uh, the eastern half of Russia. And Dinikin wanted to move on Moscow as far as possible, which was, uh, as many leaders, uh, many officers in the White Army understood, a logistical nightmare, an absolute nightmare, uh, and a stupid idea. But uh, Dinikin was commander-in-chief, so yes, they moved on Moscow after the Tsaritsyn operation. Wrangel took Tsaritsyn. It's actually quite interesting. Uh, Tsaritsyn was renamed Stalingrad, uh, not for random reasons, but because one of the leaders of the defense of Tsaritsyn against the White Army was Joseph Stalin. And uh, Wrangel took Tsaritsyn after uh, Ataman Krasnov had failed to do so for several times uh, in one of the most sophisticated combined arms operations of the whole war. 
It's um, maybe even of the first half of the 20th century overall. It was a genius operation utilizing cavalry, artillery, infantry, uh, raids and encirclements, Cossack tactics. It was a brilliant operation and maybe, um, I don't know, maybe we can sometime devote a whole episode to it because it's just so interesting and cool. For those who don't uh, understand how it all looks on the map, just uh, remember the Proto-Indo-European Urhemat. That's basically the territory that uh, volunteer army controlled at the time. Most western point was uh, Crimea and uh, it went through northern Ukraine and modern-day Krasnodarsky Krai to uh, Caspian Sea. The Tsaritsyn, or modern-day Volgograd, was uh, the easternmost point on this volunteer army controlled area. And in modern-day Kazakhstan, not far from Tsaritsyn, there were Ural Cossacks, I believe, that were split from the main army contingent. Yes, that's exactly that, that's exactly right. The Ural Cossacks were kind of in the middle between the volunteer army and the uh, armed forces of the east under, under Admiral Kochak. And what Frangel wanted to do was unite with Ataman Tolstov from the Ural host and then move on to unite with Kochak, which uh, would probably have won the White Army the Civil War. If uh, it's of course hindsight is 2020, but many people saw this uh, the way Frangel saw it, uh, simply because uh, you have to understand that the white armies of the east and the south, they were made up, they had a very different structure. In the south, you had a lot of officers and generals, and you had even whole units of officers. I think the Russian army, or like the White Guard, was the only army in history crazy enough to just make whole companies and squadrons that were completely made up of officers. While in the east, you had a lack of officers. You had many people, up to a hundred thousand on paper, of course, in reality it was uh, a lot less. But on paper, at the height, Kolchak was, uh, had a hundred thousand soldiers and way, way, way too few officers for all of them and too few competent generals, while the South had more than enough of this. But they had basically no production capacity, they had very limited manpower, I mean, the Volunteer Army began as an operation of one and a half thousand people just going from Rostov to Yekaterinodal. And uh, even at the maximum uh, it was only a few dozen thousands and uh, nowhere near the numbers of the East. So uniting these two armies would have created an immense and powerful single white army under united leadership which probably would have been able to f take Moscow in the long run. But Dinikian decided to go on Moscow straight away. The so-called Moscow Directive, it was called. Uh, a huge uh, strategic operation, which, as uh, Wrangel noted in his own memoirs, uh, was the death sentence for the armed forces of the south of Russia. So Dinikian didn't care to reconnect uh, with the uh, Ural Cossacks first, right? That's right, yeah. And there was actually quite a bit of bitterness in the Ural Cossacks after this. I think we should do an episode on the Ural Cossacks because um, they are a very interesting history uh, in the Civil War uh, because they were almost alone the whole time and they were still um, the communists actually uh, regarded the Ural front as more important than the Siberian front because the Ural Cossacks were so dangerous to them. So yeah, that's uh, and also they killed Chapaev, which is, uh, w was a very awesome operation, but we're gonna talk about it some other time. So yes, Wrangel wanted to unite with the Ural Cossacks, Denikin didn't want to, Denikin wanted to march straight on Moscow, which was a completely idiotic idea. And yeah, so basically he did that in the summer of 1919, the operation failed, uh, Moscow obviously wasn't taken by Denikin, and uh, unrest began in the ranks of the 
armed forces of the south of Russia, as the volunteer army was called at that point. And uh, Denikin became extremely unpopular. He had never been very popular, but at that point uh, it basically turned into open rebellion. And Denikin, in all his wisdom, decided that this was the right moment to basically fire Wrangel from the army, along with many officers who were sympathetic to him, like uh, Shatirov, uh, the the officer in charge of the White Guard fleet, Lukomsky, and uh, Admiral, Ni Ni Admiral Nyanyukov and Bubnov. So basically all the leadership of the White Army fleet. And yeah, that was pretty bad. And Wrangel after this wrote a scathing letter, an open letter to Denikin, in which he cited many of his strategic and political mistakes and basically told him to fuck off and that he never wants to talk to him again. This uh, letter became very famous and popular. It was printed in the Western press, it was printed in the uh, White Army press and so on. And everyone was talking about this and basically this sealed the face of Denikin. In April 1920, Denikin decided to leave his post and uh, after which there was a military council of the generals of the White Army and uh, under the leadership of General Dragomirov and they voted on who should become commander-in-chief and uh, the, yeah, Wrangel obviously was chosen as the next yeah, commander-in-chief. Let me recite some quote uh, from the time that some captain wrote. According to information that reached me, our young leader, General Wrangel, arrived to Crimea. He is the one with whom we will and must speak. He is the one who we believe. He is the one who will give his everything to fight against Bolsheviks and the criminal rear. Long live General Wrangel, our mighty and strong-willed young officer. Yes, Wrangel was immensely popular. Uh, in the army, not least of all because of his personal charisma. Uh, that was one of the many talents of General Wrangel that he always knew how to conduct himself. He was one of the things he was most famous for and where his nickname Black Baron comes from uh, was uh, that he was wearing, uh, when he appeared in front of the troops, he was always wearing a black Cherkeska. Uh, Cherkeska is a tribal basically piece of clothing from the peoples of the Caucasus which became an element of the military uniforms of Cossack units in Russia. And uh, Wrangel was always wearing one just because it looks very imposing. So he just knew how to dress, he knew how to behave himself, he always appeared on huge white horses when he spoke to the troops and everyone loved him. Um, there was an episode which was uh, kind of popularized also by our friends from Mystery Grove, an excerpt he liked to post on Twitter, uh, where Vradgil's troops uh, took a couple hundred of Red Army soldiers prisoner, and Vrangil just executed all the officers, and then told the Red Army soldiers that they would be joining the White Army now, and all of them did and uh, they just accepted this um, and none of them even deserted or something so uh, Wrangel was able to inspire immense loyalty in the troops under his command uh, both because of his charisma and because of his personal bravery and yeah so that's why he became the commander-in-chief and what happened to white army controlled territories when the advance on Moscow failed when Wrangel replaced Denikin as a chief commander? Uh, yes, well, um, the territory of course was quite small at that point, uh, since Dinikin had uh, fucked up the offensive and uh, they had to retreat and basically the White Army was Crimea and the steppes to the north of Crimea. So Tsaritsyn was more lost? Or less. Uh, yes, Tsaritsyn was lost uh, in summer of 1919. Uh, because uh, Dinikin decided not to stay in Tsaritsyn and uh, not to leave too many troops there and march on Moscow instead. 
And this is where the free segment of our podcast ends. Free yourself from tedious American monoculture and subscribe to Russians with Attitude to get full access to weekly episodes from the forbidden part of the world. Thank you.